are watching Sammy, the interviewing toucan made possible by the Indiana Young Reader Center. Hey everybody, I'm Sammy and I'm so excited. I'm here today with Paul Page and J.R. Elrod. Hi guys. Hey, how you doing Sammy? Oh Great my gosh, you. I'm so excited to be here with you both. Well, we're pretty well looking forward to what you're going to ask us. We're a little afraid, though, so be easy on us. Well, I think it'll be all right. We're, we're, we're pretty softball today. So okay. to start out, for both of you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your connection to Indiana? JR, let's start with you. I'm a lifelong resident of Indianapolis, except for uh, being away at school a couple times, and uh, grew up around the 500, but didn't really get to know it until I started writing this book here with Paul and uh, now I am just the biggest super fan you'll ever find. Paul, how about you? Well, I'm a military brat, meaning that my my um, stepfather was an army officer and so we kind of traveled the world and ended I ended up in Indianapolis uh, when I was 21 after all the adventures of going almost everywhere in one year in college. And I loved the Indianapolis 500. I had learned that when I was 15 years old, and I just wanted to do anything I could to be near it. So I have the book here. This is essentially a memoir of Paul's life, and it's all about your connection to the Indy 500. We'll definitely get to the 500, but can you both, let's talk a little bit about the process of writing the book together. So Paul, did you complete a whole draft before you passed it to John? Did you work together? Tell me a little bit about your process. I was in trouble. <laughs> I've been writing stuff and setting it aside and then writing something else. And I'd been just messing around with it for a long time. And then John came to me and said he wanted to write it. And the way he writes versus the way I write, I, I write more like a reporter. And John, the first time he brought anything to me, it was it put life into it. It made it pretty. And so John took over from there and did the bulk of the writing, but used what I had done as examples and sometimes even better guidance than that. We met once a week for about six months, uh, as tape recorder in hand and put together stories. And Paul had already had some bits and pieces of drafts here and there. And he would also record things on his own when a thought came to him. And, and then the, the book idea expanded a little bit. Uh, we added some more context and history and some other things like that. So a lot of research, a lot of fact checking, uh, and it was a great collaborative process. I just love hearing about the research aspects of book writing. I imagine, did you have a lot of fact checking you had to do? Yes, a lot yeah. of because you know everything's verifiable, and if you say the car was blue, <laughs> you got to double check that and make sure it was blue. I will say I did do some research at the state library. That's great. Well, you know I am a library bird through and through. My wings really perked up when I read in the book that Paul, when you were young, you learned a little bit about the 500 at your school libraries. Every time we had a study hall, uh, then you had just this giant room, maybe a hundred students in it, and. Uh, one one instructor to watch us, but I had two of those a day, and to get out of that giant room, you could talk them into giving you a pass to the library, so I was kind of escaping, but then I realized after I was 15 that I really liked the 500. I'd now seen it once, and so I'd head up to the library, one, to escape, and two, to start reading everything I could about the 500-mile race. JR, can you talk to us a little bit about libraries and your connection to libraries? Well, my, my mother, uh, at age 50, decided to get her second master's degree in library science, and so her career, as my brothers and I got a little bit older, was in the Marion County Public Library System. She was a children's librarian for over 20 years before she retired, so I'm, I've got a good pedigree in the library department. Oh, that's so great. So fantastic. So, Paul, people familiar with your story know that you were mentored by Sid Collins, and he was the voice of the Indy 500 from 1952 to 1976. And I was really fascinated to read in your book that it wasn't Sid who coined the phrase, the greatest spectacle in racing, but it was someone named Alice Green. Well, Alice uh, worked in the continuity department at WIBC Radio, which is kind of a, a general position. She did a little of everything. And when some of the people on the radio network were trying to find a cue, in other words, a word or a group of words to say when you were going to commercial, so all the stations around the world could then roll their commercials, you had, they had to have uh, a cue to do that. 
and said it didn't have anything yet. And he's the one that created the network, by the way, in 1952. He started the whole thing. And uh, without him, this would never have happened. They looked for a cue, and one of the producers went to the, the WIVC people and said, anybody got an idea? And Alice Green came up with the greatest spectacle in racing. And it's been that ever since, except for one year. Sounds like Sid was really an amazing guy. I was just tickled to hear that he knew Indiana author Kurt Vonnegut because they both went to Short Ridge High School. Yeah, they and went to Short Ridge together. Is that cool or what? So cool. So cool. And Sid talked about painting a picture with words to share your passion for the race over the airwaves. Can you talk a little bit about Sid? Did he do some things that you tried to emulate in his broadcasting? Well, you have to remember first that 1952, there wasn't any real television coverage of the Indianapolis, Indianapolis 500. That came much later. And so Sid told his announcers then, as he did when, when I joined them, you have to paint word pictures. You have to bring the audience to the speedway and give them the sense of the aroma, a sense of the excitement, and uh, certainly a, a sense of the bright colors on the cars and, you know, and on a good day, they're, they're flashing in the sunlight and you had to, you had to pull the audience in uh, and let them feel the 500 was one of his other expressions. We need to make them feel and feel like they're there. And I think that he did it so successfully that the giant crowds that we see today, he is in part responsible for a great part of it because he sent this magic out to the world and, uh, and the world came. Well, I think what's most amazing is how successful he was. Uh, and I think the, the great story that I'm not sure has been told anywhere before is that Sid and the radio network for the Indy 500 really brought our city to international fame. You know, anytime I've traveled overseas, people recognize my hometown in a way that they wouldn't necessarily recognize St. Louis or Pittsburgh or Cincinnati or Columbus, or you can go down through the list. Uh, everyone knows it, uh, and it is only through Sid coming up with this idea of selling the broadcast rights to radio stations throughout the country, and then Tony Holman, the owner of the Speedway back then, putting up the capital for that. Uh, we learned uh, during the research on this that the first year they sent out 5,000 solicitations to radio stations across the U.S. saying, hey, pay for us to put on the Indy 500 in your hometown. And they only got like 26 responses back. Yet uh, with the, uh, the skill and talent of Sid delivering a great product and of course, Tony Holman's foresight and saying, well, let's give it a couple more years to see what happened. It was broadcast by the 1970s, uh, you know, over a hundred million people all around the world listening to this race, listening to Sid's voice. And so I think that's one of the great stories about our town that I'm not sure I'd ever heard before. What Sid wanted to do in 1952, in theory, couldn't be done. It certainly couldn't have been done by one station. So to get all of the equipment necessary to put turn reporters out and have reporters in the pits, Sid came up with a plan to include every radio station in Indianapolis and make them part of it. So it was being carried for a time on, on most of the stations in Indy. There weren't as many as there are now. But And then the second really great move that he came up with was he talked the... Uh, American Forces Radio Network into carrying it. And of course, at the time, they were global on short waves. So he was now reaching into Germany and into Japan and everywhere else in the world because that literally blanketed the, pan the planet. So that was, a, that was a good move as well. Now, Paul, I was just really impressed to hear about your deep connection to racing. You learned racing from the inside out. You raced cars yourself. You were on a crew. You were even an EMT for a while. Can you talk a little bit about how all of those experiences helped you become a better announcer? Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to get close to racing in any way. And at that time, um, I was washing parts. I had, I had a little radio station job and I was part-timing washing parts at uh, George Bignati's race shop where Gordon Johncock and Wally Dahlenbach's cars were kept. And one thing led to another. And when I finally got a good solid job with WIBC, I, I had a little extra money. And I thought, well, let's find out if you're a race driver. It didn't take very long to find out that one, I could drive really fast, but two, I was not a race driver, meaning that I could drive fast until somebody came up alongside me. 
And then I couldn't figure out how to get through the turns with the same guy sitting over there. Yeah, one of the things in your book that I found really fascinating was you talked about the track, you know, and how on paper, all those corners are supposed to look the same. They're supposed to be identical. But all the drivers say, you know, there's this special thing in turn one you got to watch out for. You know, all those corners are different, right? Yeah, um, and they're different both physically. The bank is identical. There are little marks. You, you see there are little bumps. Not much. They, that, it was more prevalent back in the 50s, and the place has gotten smoother and smoother. Of course, back in the 50s. Uh, and before that, a lot of the track was made of paving bricks. Now there is only a three foot wide strip of those bricks at the start finish line. But um, drivers will tell you, as Mario Andretti told me, uh, there was a notch in the wall coming off of turn four, where if you were really good, you could get the right rear tire up right into that notch and you'd go faster down the straightaway. And then there's also the fact that the main straightaway is has all grandstands and that pretty much blocks any wind. And it also aids in cooling the track down once the sun gets over and the shadow is on that track. But on the back straightaway is where we see our fastest speeds. That's because it's wide open. It's uh, heavily affected by the wind. And the best thing they can have is a wind coming up from the south. Uh, so it's a tailwind for them to push them into turn three very quickly. So it's, it's different in a bunch of different ways. And back in the old days, there used to be a big smokestack. And I think you probably find pictures of it in the library uh, that said Presto light on it vertically. And the drivers looked in those days at that smokestack to see which way, which direction the wind was blowing. They didn't have oh. anything inside the grounds to guide them. So they used a smokestack about a block south of the speedway. Now, I guess they probably use a bunch of technology to tell them that, huh? They have a number of different indicators, in, including what's happening on their dashboard and in the car and what they're personally feeling. The, yeah, there, there are a couple of wind socks and markers that they look for, flags that they look for on the tops of the grandstands and down the front stretch. But also you got a two and a half mile track. So all that wind that changes pretty quickly with them. If you have a steady wind from the South, then you're in pretty good shape. Do you have an opinion about where are the best places to watch the race? Yeah, the radio booth. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. <laughs> well, if you're talking to grandstand, John may be able to jump in on this too. I think uh, on, the, on the lower deck, of turn one up high on the grandstand where you can see if you if you position it just right you can see turn four you can see the whole straightaway you can see some of the pits so it's fairly far away from you you have to have your binoculars and then you can see the short shoot in the south and uh, turn two so that gives you a pretty broad uh, broad look where, where do you sit that's precisely where i was this past may and uh, we had just a fantastic view of all those passes between the young and the and the four-time champion it was just an amazing amazing spot to watch it all happen so paul i chuckled when i read in the book that the first time you attended the 500 you thought it would be boring i think a lot of people have this misconception so what can i tell people to help them understand the thrill and the rush behind the indy 500 well back back then the only races i'd seen were in germany with uh with my family that was formula one a road course so it wasn't anything like the speedway and formula one was pretty sophisticated in those days and it had the great european names so when, when my family said, we need to send you down to Indianapolis to see the 500 because your great uncle wants to show you around and give you a good time. I, I was like, they turn left, they turn, <laughs> what? They turn left. What am I gonna do with turning left 800 times? I'm not getting it. But then when I got inside the grounds and I, I think this is pretty well written by John in the opening of the book, suddenly this whole new world surrounded me, enveloped me. And before the race started, I was convinced it was somewhere I wanted to be just by the huge crowd and the traditions and, and hearing, uh, hearing things like uh, the chief steward is now making his final tour of the course. And here come this little car out of the crowd down at the start line. And I, I just I fell in love with the traditions before I ever saw a race car go through turn one. One of the things that makes it into the book is Paul got to do some voiceover work for the movie Turbo uh, for your young <laughs> yeah. readers. Yeah. 
And I mean, we really both feel like those animators did such a wonderful job of imagining what that place is the first time you see it, really just captioning, capturing that magical, the size of it, the beauty of it, the noise, I mean, just everything about it. I thought they did such a fantastic job. And as you watch that scene open up at the beginning and you hear Paul's uh, voice narrating, I, it's just a fantastic way to, for a child to learn about the Speedway for the first time. It's very good that way. I, I will tell you this big secret. There is one mistake in there. <gasps> tell us. <laughs> if you look carefully, when Turbo first arrives at the Speedway, the sun is setting in the north. Oh. <laughs> Other than Wrong. that, it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's a it great thing. It made for a better shot, though. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> um, JR, can you tell us what was it that made you want to work on this story? Paul and I have been friends uh, probably for about a decade. And um, this is actually my first work as an author. And uh, so I thought I would pitch it uh, as a knowing that he'd been wanting to put something together for a while and and it was great to have a, a friend that could allow me to make mistakes along the way and get things wrong and and correct me and and as i learned the trade and, and got better and better i could do many many drafts and spend lots of time to, to perfect it as best as i could and so it was just a, a wonderful opportunity to do something with an old friend well but it's John was really good at keeping me honest <laughs> That's great. You know, I, had, I had this. I didn't keep a journal. And let me say that to everybody that goes to the library. Keep a journal. Write down what you've done. It doesn't have to be every day, but if you've done something fun or important. Write it down um, because without it, you're not sure and your memory gets a little fuzzy as you get older. So um, I would tell John, oh, in 1964, this happened, you know, and he'd dutifully take the note and write it down. And then a couple of days later, he said, you know, that that was really 67 that you were talking about, <laughs> things like that. But, you know, thank, thank goodness he was there with, with his expertise in research to keep me on the honest side. I love that. You know, we've all been living through a very historic time lately, and we've, at the State Library, we've really been encouraging everyone we know to keep a journal about the coronavirus. You know, um, 2020 was a historically difficult time for the race because of the virus. Paul, were you able to go in 2020 when the race ran in August? Yeah, I, I still have um, a job of sitting in the booth with the uh, regular announcers, uh, Mark James and Donald Davidson, Davey Hamilton. Uh, and I'm the guy in the back of the booth that every now and then they turn to me for an answer. And I look at the strategy overall. So uh, last year, uh, 2020 race, yes, I was, I was at the Speedway, <clears throat> but the COVID uh, had prevented more people in the booth. So I had to find another way to cover the race, another physical location. And I finally found one uh, down toward turn one uh, inside a building that was normally used as a hospitality suite, but it was open and I could watch the race and it held all the monitors that we had in the broadcast booth. So when, uh, when I'd see something that I felt was important, I would then walk outside and, and pick up my phone and record my thoughts on the phone. I went outside because I wanted the background of the, of the racetrack to sound. And then I would email that to the producer and then they'd put it on the air and you didn't know that I wasn't in the booth live, but oh. it was a very surreal day too. It just, that place was empty and it, uh, I don't think any of us left with a really great feeling. Maybe, maybe Takuma Sato did since right. he won it, but uh, <laughs> yeah. the rest of us, we just, I know, let's get out of here. How did it feel compared to this year? Oh, this year was marvelous. Wasn't this it great? Was, was huge. Not only that the crowd was there and, in a comparison of last year and, and, and this year, you realize how important the crowd is. Um, it's definitely a, a part of the part of the characters that makes the race so significant. And um, hearing the crowd, seeing the crowd, the masses of people, even though they were heavily restricted on how many people could be there, they still had quite a few people and confined to some areas. So uh, that was you're euphoric before the race starts. And then when they put on the race that they did, and then with Elio winning that race, and I, I'm a big fan of Elio's, uh, it just turned out to be a perfect day. Paul, do you feel like the Indianapolis Motor Speedway is in good hands right now? Oh, absolutely. Uh, Roger Penske uh, owning it. It's his life dream. Uh, I've watched Roger ever since he came into motorsports and came to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. 
and he just loves racing uh, and he loves to win. That's obvious. He's got a bunch. He's the owningest winner, winningest <laughs> owner at the Indianapolis 500. I'm an announcer, you know, <laughs> um, and, but he has a sense of its tradition and what, what race fans need and what the Speedway needs to survive. And he brings all that in and he refers to himself as a steward of the race, that it's in his stewardship. Uh, and so that makes it in his mind and mine as well, uh, it's a little different than being the owner. Uh, he understands there's a legacy there that he has to preserve and take care of, as well as making it a viable event. Yes, you know, in libraries, a lot of time we talk about being good stewards of our resources, right? Because there are things that we own, but um, they're really for everyone to, to share and partake in. So I love hearing that that he wants to be a good steward of it. You know, I meant to ask you this earlier, but I forgot. Did you guys have anything for show and tell? I got, I got one thing. Okay, all right, let's see your show and tell. I can find him. I had a few race cars back here. This is the car that uh, Mario Andretti used to win the 500 in 69. And it's an interesting car in that if you look down here on the nose, there's only a nose wing on the left side of the car. Oh my goodness. Nothing over here. And that's not a mistake. That's the way they, they built the race car. If you look at it aerodynamically today, you would say, what were they thinking? Because <laughs> that would not help. In fact, that probably made the car a lot harder to drive. But then if you want to talk about racing greats, here he is. There's Turbo. <laughs> so I'll get a little closer. That's Turbo. He looks kind of tasty. Fastest snail on the planet. <laughs> I love that. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of that. Well, Paul, John, this was just a delight. Thank you guys so much for agreeing to be interviewed by a toucan. Yeah, it was fun, Sammy. Yay. Well, everyone, this is your favorite Hoosier toucan encouraging you to read local. So long, everyone. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.